Guests in my podcast are like my coffee, strong, flavorful, and they always brighten my day. We have amazing conversations over coffee. We cover everything from growth to inspiring communities, empowering customers, and sharing exceptional leadership moments. In this season, we're hosting incredible leaders whose journeys inspired me to keep growing and learning every day. I'm Iman, and I welcome you to my podcast, Coffee With Me, Leaders of Change. Hi, everyone, and welcome to my podcast, Leaders of Change. Today, I have a very special guest. And guess what? He's my boss. So I'm freaking out right now. Today, I have with me Ahmed Mazari. He is the president of Microsoft Asia. Welcome, Ahmed. Thank you, Iman. What a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm so excited. Equally. Let's take a seat. So welcome, Ahmed. And I must tell you, I'm nervous. <laughs> I have interviewed tons of people, but I've never interviewed my boss. So this is a first for me. Are you practicing psychological safety in a live environment? I think I am. I'm trying. I'm trying. So this is recorded, and this is live and public. And Ahmed tells me this is a 360 for me. Isn't it? Vice versa. Also. Vice versa. Or could be. Could be. OK, sounds good. Sounds good. You know, you just mentioned about public speaking and how you know uh, your teacher was so good Well, he helped you get into your public speaking at a very young age. It's actually, it goes back to when I was probably in middle school uh, and uh, we had an event on yes. a science festival that uh, he prompted me to go and speak publicly. It may be 100, 200, you know, and there were young kids who I would have spoken to but never had the courage to stand up and speak. Wow. Uh, there are a couple of lessons in that. One was um, he provided me the confidence that you can speak and that you're not going be judged, etc. But equally in the power of preparedness and how you prepare for such things. So he would spend time after school with me. Uh, and that's an early lesson as to how you must invest in your people and how you must invest in people you, you feel responsible for development. And there's no better time in your life than early age to learn some of these skills. So I remain ever indebted to what I've learned from him. I love it. I love it. And you're so comfortable with your public speaking. How You did what, like eight, nine events in two weeks in well, September? Well, I did many. I, I did many over the last few weeks, and I couldn't have done without uh, the support of my team. So I always think like, you know, a, a leader is only successful if uh, they are uh, enabled by their teams. Uh, my teams did a fantastic job in different cities uh, around Asia that I went to. And it's energizing because I can share my experience, I can share my learning, and equally I can, I can learn from others too. Yeah, so this is recorded. He said, you said the team is great. That's good. <laughs> That's awesome. Ouch. <laughs> you certainly are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, you know, you mentioned about early in career. You mentioned about uh, getting early age and teaching people at early age. And that certainly also, you know, helped you when, when it comes to leadership. And you started your leadership journey at very young age as well. I think it's your early 20s. How did that shape the, the trajectory so far? Yeah, you, you know, I, I probably go back and rewind a little bit. Yeah. And I've often said that my first boss probably made one of the biggest impact that, that uh, one can make in, in, uh, in people's career. And uh, very early, he would, he would teach the very interesting balance of how do you allow people to go to the edge, perhaps make a mistake, but be there to save them and help them come back. Um, and he, he did uh, an exceptional job of that, and including but not limited to even promoting me a little early. To, to lead uh, you know, a couple of people in the team. And most of the team members who I had to leave uh, had you know, more years um, uh, yes. than, than I had. Uh, but that was what has allowed me over time to take better people. Because I said to myself, I said, look, if at that young age, my manager was able to take a bet on me, and at that young age, uh, he was around to help and coach, but also allow me to take the big leaps, Mm. then my role as a leader has to be 
to provide a platform for other people to be able to do that, and I endeavor to do it. And I've, I've, you know, I've appointed people yes. uh, into jobs when they've not been fully ready. I've tried to coach them, um, and and mostly I've had great response back. Yes, yes. And you always, you know, uh, look into the org of the future. You're always looking for leaders. You mentioned once that. You are on the recruiting and you are on meeting people every single day just to look into talent and nurture talent and be a talent magnet. It is quite true. I met somebody this morning. Wow. And uh, I, I tend to meet one to two uh, leaders a week. Uh, and these are people that I may meet, you know, sometimes for the first time, sometimes, you know, it's, it's the second or third time. The way I think about, about this aspect, Iman, is... My job is to match demand with supply, mm -hmm. meaning you need a talent, you need a certain role to be filled, and I'm not trying to recruit only for that. Yes. So what I do is I spend time thinking about people who I have met or who could fit that role. There are people that I've met even two years back uh, who I then suddenly think about their 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 ability to make impact in a role. And I say, okay, now let me call them. Uh, somebody I just hired on my direct team, you know, I have worked for about a decade and a half. Wow. And I reached out with, to this person about a year ago and said, hey, you know, are you interested in talking to us? And then, you know, this person is on board in the last several months, uh, last couple of months, actually. So I think I would urge people to not think about recruitment as an episodical event, but yeah. recruitment as a continuous process. Because, you know, you, you meet different talent, you learn from them, you learn what's happening in the market. And, and today in the age when, when technology and, and innovation is being driven by uh, sometimes a generation that's, you know, behind you yes. in terms of experience and expertise, you know, the upside is that you learn from it and, and oftentimes you run into great people. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I love it. And I'm one of them. You called me on Sunday and I said yes. So and, you know, it's been a journey, a great learning experience since since last year. So that's really amazing. Thank you for your confidence. I said yes. I didn't know for which role. I just said yes. And I told Khalid, my husband, what did I sign up for again? But, you know, that was really awesome. Thank you for your trust. Thank you for having me. Um, the other thing I want to, to switch to is, you know, you joined Microsoft at the age of 50. Mm -hmm. New role, new region, new industry, new everything. Mm -hmm. That's the epitome of being bold and daring to lead. And I've been always curious to learn and understand what was the reasoning behind it. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Iman. And I could drain the entire hour uh, kind of reflecting and talking about it. But uh, my perspectives were the following. You know, I was born in this part of the world, but did not, uh, you know, almost a few years in, you know, left India and didn't work deeply in Asia. Um, and I always had this thing about the Asian century. People would talk about the Asian century and, you know, 60% of the population lives there. We have some high growth economies. We have economies that are taking... Uh, you know, generational changes in the way they operate. And uh, it just appealed a lot to me that, hey, I, I could be working in Asia um, as part of a career run, which if I hadn't, I might, I might have regretted. Uh, I got closer to my parents, which was a fantastic upside. Uh, and I was fascinated by the culture and the technology pivot that Satya and Microsoft made. Yes. Um, and so all that added up and I said, Am I comfortable being uncomfortable? And that's the core question I ask people all the time. And if you can be comfortable being uncomfortable, it actually shows growth mindset. That means you're okay if you do not get it right all the time. As long as you learn something new, as long as you have an ability to, to contribute towards the progress. And I thought in taking this role at the age of 50, I was going to tick many boxes, and I could not have done uh, a better thing to myself by gifting this opportunity to me. But equally, I got to thank Microsoft for the growth mindset and the courage that they had to pick someone uh, from the outside. And then you came and then COVID hit. I didn't plan for that. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
you know, I had an onboarding plan which yes. was uh, ambitious, which was detailed, which was geographically dispersed, including doing, you know, field trips uh, with then, you know, Jean-Philippe, who I, I yes. worked for, and going to Redmond and, you know, being in the markets and talking to partners. And that hit a reset moment. It was a complete control all delete moment for me within a few weeks of joining the company. And if you go back and think about what that teaches you, yes. that teaches you that business and environments are beyond your control. And focus on stuff that you can control. And deal with stuff that you cannot control with mental agility and adaptability. And that is another skill that I developed during COVID, which is how do you build relationships when you haven't met? How do you connect in a new company um, when I barely met with half the people in my leadership team. Uh, you'd be surprised to know that from the time I hired Yang, who runs our Greater China business, to when I actually met him was a year and a half later. Wow. Wow. No, I mean, kudos to you. Kudos. It's really impressive. And hence, you know, I really wanted uh, to invite you to the podcast because you are a leader of change. Uh, that's exactly what you are doing every single day in this organization. And uh, one of the things that I really admired is when you took Japan directly. And, oh, my God, you learned about the Japanese culture. You learned about honne tatemai and, and all the things that you know, unless you immerse yourself in a Japanese culture or in a, a culture of a country, you wouldn't know about. And that was so incredible. Japan for me uh, will certainly stick in my list of things that I would write about if I ever wrote about uh, my own journey uh, yeah. in my life uh, and my work journey, my personal journey. Uh, Japan's taught me a lot. Uh, Japan's taught me the power of um, precision. Uh, Japan's taught me the power of agreement. Uh, Japan's taught me the power of innovation. Yes. Um, and I'm incredibly fortunate that what sounded like a short-term decision and it lasted for almost a year, yes. um, not only did, did I make personal progress on my own leadership journey, uh, I think uh, I uh, have, in working with the team, helped the team see uh, a part of Microsoft that they were not exposed to at the level uh, of opportunity um, that had existed in the past. Uh, I also think that uh, we created an environment of psychological safety there, uh, which is very, very powerful. Uh, and I also think that uh, we, were, we created an environment where, where people thought that individually and collectively they were contributing to the cause of Microsoft and to the cause of technology. Yes, I loved it. I loved it. You know, if there is one anecdote on Japan, it was when you invited hundreds of your senior leadership team, the Japanese senior leadership team, for an offsite. And then you made the offsite in Japanese. And you were the one with the translator for two or three, uh, three days of the offsite. And that showed to the team that you work for them, not the other way around. And they were the ones who were speaking. 90 people were speaking in Japanese, 10 needed the translation, and you were one of those tens who did that. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, Iman, it's a great example that you pick up. And this is not only about Japan, but uh, we mustn't forget that there are many other countries in the world where English is not the first language. And sometimes we multinationals can default to believing and, and hoping uh, and sometimes just wanting yes. uh, that English is the only language of conversation. Um, we made the call because it's interesting. Our CFO uh, is, is Greek and, uh, and doesn't, uh, doesn't speak Japanese. Our COO is American and, and, and I uh, was. And like you said, 10% you know, of the people uh, did not speak Japanese. But that meeting was not for us. The meeting was for them. Correct. Uh, and, and in many ways, the meeting became more effective because they were not having to think and speak, uh, think, translate, and speak. They were, th they were speaking their mind. They were speaking their heart. And, and it really created a lot of impact. And you created a psychological safety for 100 people because they were open to talk in their own language and be free to express themselves. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So now, 
go into another aspect, you know, you have so many, you're a multifaceted uh, uh, person and, and leader. You know, we always talk about compliance and ethics. And you always make a point to have the governance of compliance, the governance of, of ethics. You never once reschedule or cancel that meeting. It's so important to you, to the core. And when I discussed with you, you mentioned about, you know, having that impact from very young age as a young Ahmed, uh, having learned a lesson with his mom would be great to share that. Yeah, you know, this is a, a very early lesson. Uh, uh, it seems you've gone back and read a little bit about me. And um, I, I still remember I was probably, you know, in kindergarten, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And um, to cut the long story short, um, somebody had gifted me something which I decided I should keep. And uh, at least that's you as a child. As a child, and you know, it's a, it's a nice. It was a nice toy. It was a little bit that you know, those airplanes that would run, that would swing around, hung from the top of the roof. Um, and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. I got it, and I was really d dying to have one. And then I, then my parents realized that uh, uh, I was a bit sneaky on that one, and. Um, they actually um, said that they were going to return it to whoever gave it to me because it was not appropriate. I was devastated. I was crying. I was not happy. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a lesson for life. Yes. It's a lesson that uh, proves uh, that you can learn at any point in time. You might, you might not feel at the moment that impact happens. Yeah that it was a lesson worth it. But when you reflect back in your life, these are very deep lessons for you. Absolutely. And, and uh, I am just fortunate that that was, uh, the bar was set uh, by my parents uh, at a very high level. And it's very important for, for business. You know, this morning you might have seen an email that I sent out that uh, came from our chief compliance officer and you see, you know, this public company where the CFO has to resign because yes. of the fact that there was a business ethics problem. Now, it was, it was an issue that got raised. And yes, these are fine lines. And in these fine lines, you have to draw the bar very high. Yes. There is nothing that can be more devastating than breaking trust in the broader society that we operate in. I love it. I love it. So. Fun questions. Yes. What keeps you energized? Um, it depends on which time of the day you're asking <laughs> me <laughs> and which day of the week you're asking me. Um, but currently, I'm having a lot of fun with AI. Yes. Uh, and what I mean by fun with AI is not I'm not going to chat GPT to write poems or you know get itineraries done. Uh, which I've tried, by the way, and, but I don't spend too much time on that because writing poems creates carbon footprint, which we should not, <laughs> that we can do, but put to better use. But I'm really excited because uh, we're at an innovation curve, Iman, which um, I think Microsoft has not experienced in a long time. Industry has not experienced in a long time. And this is truly a technology that will help create progress. Yes. It's a technology that enables democratization of the usage of AI in everybody's life. And that's what excites me today. It excites me that I am part of and humbly uh, responsible for an area of the world where 60% of the population lives, 70% of the economic growth will happen, where we can truly create inclusive healthcare, inclusive education, including inclusive financial inclusion, um, and enable industries and communities to progress. So that's what is super exciting. Uh, and then, you know, whenever I go for a run, I get excited. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> we need to slot run for you. Run time is very critical. Thank you. It's part of my well-being. Yes, yes. So last question of the day. We have an audience that's first-time leaders, aspiring to become leaders, you know, mid-management. What would you advise them? Yeah. 
Um, one advice is hard to give. So um, I'll start by saying, you look at leaders over centuries, over decades, across geographies, we've all made mistakes. Mm. And if you haven't tried, you won't learn. And therefore I encourage people to try new things, to learn new things, yeah. to work in different geographies, to try different industries, because it widens your aperture. It widens your ability to absorb different things. The second thing I, I, I would say, and I say this to, to young leaders, leaders in general, is don't worry and don't judge yourself, okay? I think we get caught by, yeah. oh, if I do this, you know, is it the right thing? Just be a good human. Focus on doing the right things. Yeah. And be humble when things are not right to learn and move on. I've often in my life said that there have been times when I have thought making a mistake would show that I'm not competent. And as I've grown older, I've realized that making a mistake means I may have tried something new. Maybe I didn't plan better. I could have planned better. Uh, maybe I could have taken more inputs and I didn't take enough inputs. Maybe I didn't bring everyone in the journey together and I should do that. So I think you become a little bit more experienced. Yes. But keep trying, keep learning, keep asking. Keep making mistakes. And as long as you don't make the same one again. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Ahmed. I enjoyed the conversation. Now, thank you, Iman, for, for having me. And like I said, this could have gone on for longer, but I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I appreciate your leadership and great to see this podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. See you in the next episode.